We've got two more talks left before cocktail hour. All right. <laughs> so uh, up next, a show of hands, who likes tech debt? Anybody? Man, nobody. Well, we'll see if a sprinkle of it might be a little bit helpful. All right. <laughs> uh, we got on that here. Up next. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name's Amit Somali. Um, I'm a uh, technical research and development partner at uh, Tight Technologies. Um, started out at life as a consulting engineer, um, working with prospects and also um, management of existing uh, clients, ex assisting them from technical evaluation, uh, training, um, and helping them on their digital journey, whether they're replacing an incumbent solution or are looking to put an API management solution in place, or maybe they've got a greenfield project um, which they need to secure. Um, more, see, more recently, I've moved into the product leadership team, so uh, purely technical, where I get to um, evaluate various technologies, research the market, and have input into the strategic, strategic mode, uh, roadmap of the type platform. Um, I've gained quite a bit of exposure to understanding the needs of startups through to enterprises um, across a spectrum of industry verticals, whether that be travel and tourism, banking, um, boutique fashion brands, and government also. Um, and if you like the talk, and, um, or you want to know more about Tyke as a product to manage your APIs, um, or if you're looking for best-in-class stickers and edibles in the industry, come to our stand and um, say hi. Um, over the next 20 minutes, um, I'll be provoking some thoughts about um, how you go about evaluating the cost of the technology choices that you make. So, I happened to be reading a copy of The Paradox of Choice when I was asked to, um, uh, to do this talk. And it's by an American psychologist named Barry Schwartz, and it forms the inspiration for my talk today. Um, the book's mainly consumer-focused, whereby Schwartz argues that the um, eliminate, eliminating consumer choices can greatly reduce anxiety for shoppers. Um, and whilst reading this book, I could totally relate, not only at a personal level, um, but was also to, able to apply and expend what he was saying to technology evaluation. So if you get the opportunity, I hi highly recommend you have a read. Um, October of 99, I passed my driver's test, and I inherited my grandfather's Alfa Romeo. He purchased it new when I was born. Um, it was a true rust bucket by the time I got it. Um, but when I, um, and to go with my first car, my parents bought me my first mobile phone, the Nokia NK402. Amazing uh, 17th birthday presents, um, truly lucky. Um, pair as you go phone, um, it lived in the glove compartment of the car, switched off, and only came out to be recharged. Um, it was in my emergency phone in case the car broke down, and that was fine. I wasn't going to be walking around with that brick in my pocket. So um, in terms of functional requirements, oh, sorry. Um, second phone, um, upgrade. Went to university, treated myself to the 8210. It was brilliant. Had Snake, small enough for me to go to discos, fit in my pocket, um, send text messages, and made phone calls. Um, I'd drop it on the floor, smash it to pieces, put it back together again, dropped it in a pint of beer, take it out, leave it in a cup of rice. Um, and it would dry out, and I could just use it again the next day. So um, fast forwarding a few years, and I changed vendor to BlackBerry. Wow, what a difference. Um, migration path was move contacts to SIM card, load SIM into the new BlackBerry. Improved BB Messenger, had the trackpad scroll thingy, full keyboard, internet browser, color screen, email, Wi-Fi, but I lost Snake. I could do with one less. Um, a few more years, and um, now I have the App Store. I could download any application large color screen, better browsing, navigation experience, iTunes, Safari, better browser, better camera. And um, can anybody say, uh, guess what I said to my friends after two days of owning this phone? <laughs> um, despite being um, clearly more capable, it was, uh, I want my BlackBerry back. Um, despite being a more capable phone, I had no BB Messenger. The messages were not transferable to my new iPhone. I had a lower battery life. The battery was non-replaceable. I had a worse email experience um, with you know, multiple mailboxes, you know, best in class with BlackBerry at the time. Um, still no snake, and I had no buttons either, apart from the middle one. Um, it was really a strange feeling of happiness and regret. Um, 
upgrading my phone again a few years later. I mean, I'm sure you can see I tend to use my phones far beyond their intended lifetime. Um, and in that time that I owned my iPhone, I'd, un I'd unknowingly accrued um, quite a bit of technical debt and vendor lock-in. I'd been using and installing various applications, which were iPhone only. I'd been using iMessage, Apple TV Remote, Augmented Reality Sky Guide app. Have a look if you haven't seen it, it's pretty cool. Um, and after scanning the market for far too long, it boiled down to a choice of three brands. And I wanted to try Android for various reasons, but despite putting various Android devices into my shopping basket over the course of several months, I couldn't come to actually complete checkout. Um, I've got a busy life with far more important things to do than choosing, an, than choosing a new phone. Owing to familiarity, compatibility, and just ease of upgrading, I bought into the latest, latest iPhone once again. Um, and despite the fact that it is a phenomenal phone, um, I just don't feel comfortable with that niggling feeling about the opportunity cost of the alternative foregone. So everything was better when everything was worse. So the little quirks and niggles become further amplified and they prevent my enjoy enjoyment of a new phone because of the fact that I know that I'm locked in and that I have alternative options which I feel trapped about taking. And because of this, I can't help but have that Nostal nostalgic feelings about my first Nokias and BlackBerry Bold, even though my expectations rose and the newer tech is vastly superior to the phones of the olden days. Everything was better when everything was worse. Now, unfortunately, in our industry, tech evaluation is not any easier. It's considerably more complex, um, but it feels like exactly the same thing is happening. We went from jQuery to Ember to Angular to React and Vue. And with all the great um, and powerful capabilities that these new frame frameworks bring, we still have some considerable downsides. Despite having more power, we now need Babel, ES6 to ES5 transpilation. We need NPM, bundlers and watchers. Then a Node.js server to go back um, to server-side rendering. And now I'm building a back-end just for my front-end. We've got CoffeeScript and then TypeScript, and now the renaissance of writing pure JavaScript. Um, I've got all this power, but I'm no longer fo focusing on um, functional requirements, getting things done, but learning and using tooling, which has got absolutely nothing to do with the business logic of my application. In the back-end world, we have the LAMP stack, um, steadily, you know, which steadily evolved, super stable, performance, secure. Um, what's more, a simple Laravel application could allow extremely rapid prototyping, where a relatively complex application can be near production ready within a week, just by following some sensible design patterns. But despite this, we went from LAMP to MEAN to some kind of Frankenstein monster polyglot because we want to do microservices. Everything just got so damn complex. Um, we can do all this cool stuff on the front end, but really, if we think about it, jQuery and Friends was kind of great, and call me naive, but the vast majority of things that we actually want to do today can still be achieved with jQuery. Um, in terms of databases, it's not enough to have a master save Postgres or multi-master. We've now got so much choice with database, and the mantra seems to be to use the best tool for the job. But back in the day, we had DB admins who knew how to optimize and tune a database. Um, they, they know how to properly index and normalize a table, and we're losing that capability these days. GraphQL, awesome technology, but... Um, you know, managing and protecting GraphQL APIs in an open world um, is, you know, extremely complex. You can't just, it's not, you can't just treat it as a normal REST API and just shove it out there and think everything will be fine. Um, you've got so many considerations like complexity-based rate limiting, how, you know, all kinds of things like that. How do I secure um, enabling OpenID Connect OAuth 2 for GraphQL services? It, it, it gets very complex. And with serverless, if you use a Lambda function, which is amazing, but how do you go about debugging Aurora SQS in your local development environment? So this is a little, um, take this opportunity to read you a poem by um, our CEO, Martin. Um, a serverless can be a server more, as Lambda and cloud functions do not bore. But solid design, yes, solid design will be forever. Generic abstractions to the dark side lead. 
So take the step, but choose wisely, for to shrink your bill is most unlikely. So um, whilst we're getting all these new technologies, our applications are getting more complex, and we start needing more and more flexibility. So cloud, cloud vendors came to the rescue with a promise of flexibility, agility, financial savings, and they're helping us to eliminate choice. But at what cost? What if the vendor's offerings no longer need, meet my needs? What if the vendor uh, makes a product change which simply doesn't work for my business? And what happens if the vendor goes out of business? All will be fine as long as I integrate deeper and deeper into their product offerings and accept the fact that I'm being locked in. Some of our clients have successfully managed to switch API management providers literally three times over the last five years. Um, come over if you want to hear more. Um, any of you feel like this? <laughs> um, so what I ho hope to be able to do is give you a little bit of insight into how you can um, stay abreast of this and stay in control. Um, have you thought about a prenuptial agreement? Um, before getting married um, to your cloud or technology vendor, you need to ensure that you're protecting your business. Include an exit plan and evaluate your potential risks and costs of changing at the time of procurement or before procurement. Um, it's not switching. Oh, now it is. Um, prefer open solutions. They allow your applications to be both flexible and loosely coupled. Now, um, this is not always possible and sometimes a little unrealistic, but if you're going to go down the proprietary technology route, then at least try to ensure that this technology is not in your critical path and account for this debt as a strategic debt, um, which at some, time, at some point will need to be repaid. Um, in the case of my field of API management, all the latest and greatest of capabilities which give the API management vendor a competitive advantage, they're not necessarily common across other vendor solutions. So take that into consideration. If you rely on open standards, you can switch more easily because there's more tooling. But when you use those very specific features, it's a lot harder to unpick. And so for all of you architects in the, out there, in your next project, try to think about solving your business problems using open standards. So over um, the years that this technology has emerged, what does cloud native mean to me? It allows me to develop my applications as a microservice or monolith if I want to, no problem at all with monoliths, and package it as a container. It allows me to install on any cloud provider's elastic infrastructure. It allows me to deploy using DevOps processes such as CI, CD pipelines. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. And this new fancy um, containerization allows us to perform, to form complex microservice constellations. And now you just increased complexity levels by orders of magnitude and need orchestration and distributed tracing and Istio. Um, it's a, you know, a real mess. Um, does anybody know who, which bank this is? Um, this for me is not, um, you know, focusing on what my business does. But yeah. <laughs> um, evolution versus lift and shift. I have lots of services in place that have accumulated over time, which are critical to the business. Um, refactors are expensive, both time and money, and migrating to Kubernetes is expensive. I can start by containering my applications, then slowly moving them into Kubernetes. And I think I need service mesh, but what am I missing? If I'm migrating to new technologies, do it slowly, gain experience and understanding before putting all your eggs into one basket. Otherwise, you might find the etcd cluster just crashed and then you're going to have to, um, you know, then you just lose the entire Kubernetes, um, the, the entire Kubernetes cluster just because of one application crashing. Um, bleeding edge technology. Um, it, it carries a lot of risk. It allows you to gain competitive advantage if implemented correctly. So there's the chance of massive gains, but don't forget that 90% of your requirements can almost certainly be achieved 
using tried and tested methods. And when your developers come to you telling you that they want to write GraphQL services, I'm not saying don't use it, but consider what's currently cool might just be a um, what's cool might just be either a CV enrichment exercise or something that they just want to be doing because it's fun. Um, don't disregard emerging technologies. Look at trends. Keep abreast, but don't commit unless it's necessary. Um, Facebook used PHP for many years, and I'm sure they still have PHP in their stack. Google created Kubernetes, um, initially the Borg, in order to solve their problems. Netflix has a blog post, and you can read their blog, um, you can read their blog posts and replicate what you see. But what you can't see um, is the business processes and thoughts behind installing all of this technology. So just by installing Istio, you're not becoming Google. And perform an annual audit. Um, review any technology that you've procured in your stack. Do you still need it? Um, how is your customer support? Is it still performing to your expectations? So to summarize, I've told you a bit my, about my personal phone debacle. And um, as technologists and architects, we all have to make decisions every day. Not just one, but hundreds. And we need to effectively weigh up the pros and cons and decisions we make. Unlike a phone choice, the decisions we make can break or make or break a business. And if there's anything that you're going to remember from today, I'd like it to be that nothing comes for free. Remember Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It's always easy to see, quantify, and reason about the positive side of the seesaw. But the trade-off is not so easy to quantify and achieve balance. Don't forget to evalu uh, evaluate the real cost of acquiring that new capability and ensure that you keep track of any debt that you incur, because it will inevitably need to be repaid. So thank you very much. Um, come to see us uh, at our stand. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, we have time for a few. All right, new tech versus old tech. Any questions about that? All right, looks like no questions at all. Well, big round of applause. <laughs>